a welcome. Uh, Uh, so, uh, so basically, 
thousands of, of young people, they would send the latest thing that they had to 10 or 100 other people, and all of them were doing the same. So it was this like very random but very efficient way to you know, transfer information. But this was not the only thing uh, that was discussed. This is a letter from my friend in Norway. Um, he's explaining how to do this hidden line 3D algorithm. Uh, and, yeah, and this was, yeah, for me, sort of challenging math at this time. Um, and this uh, culture, I mean, it still exists. Uh, and it grew uh, to quite big scale. These are photos from gathering 2002. Those are computers. So it's a, yeah. And it's still, but it's still kind of the same, same thing. Uh, it's still, um, yeah, young people with their computers spending the weekend together. And yeah, the reason why I wanted to show these photos is, is that, that this is something that we have in Europe. We have amazing amount of subcultures, <laughs> hacker cultures, maker cultures, etc. And um, and a lot of information is a lot of innovation is is happening there. And, uh, and, and kind of what I associ associate with this is, is something that I would call digital craftsmanship. Like basically you learn the skills only if you spend years and years and years and, in, in refining the skills. And this is what you don't learn at school at all. And, and I, I grew up in this culture and, and the friends that I have from, from this these, these times, I mean, they, they are, most of them are, are now in the games industry. So Finnish game industry, which is really strong right now, it wouldn't exist without this culture. But when this culture was happening, I mean, no one knew that this would be the outcome. Uh, so, so it took yeah, quite a long time for this to, to develop to that direction. So yeah, so this is a craftsmanship Agriculture is something that we have um, here in Europe. And the other thing that I wanted to show related to potential of digital innovation is related to city of Helsinki. Um, this is, um, yeah, you cannot see it probably, but it's a, it's, it's a visualization of, of Helsinki city information systems. There was uh, a study last year or two years ago about the information systems that Helsinki city has. And the outcome was that there were about 1,000 different information systems that the city of Helsinki has. And, and this, is a, um, this is a great quote. It's in Finnish, but I'll translate it. Uh, <laughs> no one in this organization has a full picture of all the information systems in the city. And the person who said this is the chief information architect of Helsinki City. <laughs> so basically it's a big mess and, and this is, I think this is the case with a lot of information infrastructure that we have today. And what has been amazingly successful for, for Helsinki is, has been open data. So, so they, they have a separate independent company who can operate outside the the the, um, the organization and 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 regarding transport data, budget data, decision making data, they are making fantastic progress on basically letting go of this structure and and, and, and starting a new one that is really based on, on more more sort of participatory. I mean, basically, what we'll be discussing over the past next three four days here. So so it's not the heads of the city, but other actors who turn this into something new. Yeah, so that, like these two examples, that's my contribution. One of the discussions in, in social digital innovation is um, this 
it start with social innovation or does it start with the technology that enables it? Uh, and these two examples, how do you look at that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think what was, what was essential in, uh, in these early days of computers was that they were a challenge and no one kind of knew what they were meant for and back then you had to learn assembly language so in some way it was a challenge in the same way I, I, I see open data as an open challenge and we still don't know all the things that will come out of that so in some way I, I see that this sort of more like a technological challenge can be a cure for a lot of social interaction and and so on. Um, but then, uh, yeah, but it's, but, it's, but it's sort of, it's like a chicken and egg thing. You know? It's difficult to say what comes first. Okay, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I know somebody between you, but not all, so I say who I am. Uh, I have been uh, for my life a professor, academic, since it's a better word, but I try to qualified it academic in uh, design and I follow all the trajectories that started from what has been designed uh, some decades ago towards what it is today that is mainly something related to interaction how to create the environment that permit to people to interact in a better way in between themselves in between uh, human human and between human things in human uh, places and the environment doing that we started to work on uh, services and uh, we move from traditional services to the collaborative services and the collaborative services are mainly cases of social innovation so me my group we arrive today issue about social innovation and now there is an international network that is called DAGES uh, that is a network of labs that are in uh, now 40 different schools around the world where we try to promote the idea that design has something to do with social innovation both inside our community and outside this community. So I will focus on uh, what uh, is more near to my experience. So uh, it is, uh, there could be many different stories to be told, but I will tell the one that uh, I know better is more related to what we do. It's uh, mainly related about uh, how in the digital social innovation we can take in account who are the user or the prosumer or the citizens in the different way that we can call. So the issues about uh, social innovation and uh, digital IT, internet and so on. And there is one kind of uh, keyword that is uh, the network effect that is one of the possible strategies to be used to increase the effectiveness of uh, what we are doing or the, the impact of what we are doing. So this kind of uh, positive uh, interaction in between social innovation and the new technologies can be seen at a small scale and there are around the world many different examples now very interesting and powerful, this is one, but there are many others, in which a group of people do something together, in this case uh, they help uh, each, each uh, one another one and also they help uh, somebody that is in need. And of course, there are platforms that permit to organize whatever they are doing. And uh, in general, we can say that this platform permit to uh, take persons that in the life that we have today could live a very complicated life with different timing, different spaces. So they would have difficulties to be in the right place in the right moment, doing something that be socially useful. And the platform help in making this happen. But in this case, in my view, it's difficult to talk about uh, network effect in the traditional way of talking because uh, in this case, it's very important to have a small group of people at the end of the day that is capable to do something. And so if we want to have a bigger impact, the issue is in some way to replicate this idea, to spread the idea, but with other kind of strategy that we are not going to talk today. Well, when we talk about social innovation, and uh, the network effect, uh, we have to talk, we are talking about uh, big numbers. And the challenge of the research that we have discussed this morning is exactly to try to see what is the challenge. And this, I have to say also for, for me, it's uh, all my work and the work of the people that I work with have been mainly on the first examples. So this 
one is something that is going to start. It seems also to me to be very promising. So I'm very happy to be here to discuss about these stories and to see what could be the network effect. But in any case, one of missing point in my view in this discussion is very often that we discuss uh, how they are organized, how they are financed, uh, so many different facets. But it is not so clear what is uh, the standing point of uh, the people in that, what they do. So who are the people? And uh, if all this uh, innovation at the end ask to collaborate, what does it mean? Why they should collaborate? What are the motivation and what are the possibilities that they have to collaborate? So first of all, what, why they should do it? And uh, so what they should do it? And if we look to the different the example, we can have something that is very simple, is simply to say yes or not, to say I like it or I don't like it. So the involvement is very light, or you have to give an information that you already had, so you know something and you bring your knowledge as it is to the network, or you have to collect information to make something that is not already there, so you start to have to work for this, or you have to really act on the world. So you have not only to deal with information, but you have to, for instance, any, uh, the initiative of cleaning, clean, to a very simple one, cleaning up the world, is not only to talk about how to clean the world and to share information about that, but one day you have to do it. And in this case, you still do it as an individual with only, as we will see, a vertical relationship with who is organizing this kind of initiative. And finally, you have when through this kind of initiative, you try to promote also what they call the horizontal collaboration. That means that you have to manage information, to act, and to engage some relationships with the other. So, of course, I will not go in depth in this, but it's clear that is uh, totally diverse to try to convince people simply to push the button and to say I like it or not, or to ask people to be involved in something that has complicated interaction work very horizontally with different kinds of empathic relationship with people and so on and so forth. So if we have to discuss about this, this uh, maybe the language, I don't know if it's correct, but vertical horizontal uh, collaboration could be very important. There is another point that is very important, so when uh, you should participate. Because probably you all know this kind of a very simple trajectory. It's totally diverse if we are at the beginning and you have to convince the first adopter that probably they do not have such an advantage in doing it. So they are kind of heroes. Or if you are in the moment of the expansion, the people need to be part of the movement. So they are not anymore such a heroes as before, but still the ideological motivation is very strong. Or if you are when it's stable, and so you are the new mainstream. Because at the end of the day, if we are promoting this kind of innovation, it's because we hope that at a certain point, this will become the new mainstream. And the way in which you are comfortably in the new mainstream is still diverse from the others. So, when we discuss how people can participate, it's totally different if you are talking about people that have to be heroes, people that have to be part of the movement, or people that have to be part of the new active citizenship. So what are the motivation? Also the motivation, it's, there is a little bit of mess when we talk. Frequently in the literature, is we talk about we have a result, people do it because they have to share houses, they have to share some knowledge, they have to get some result. But there is also an issue about meaning. And so the people, especially when you are here or when you are in the movement, the meaning, the motivation about the cultural dimension of what you are doing is very important. And there is also the sociability. So it's not something that is related only to the end point, but it's related to the way in which you do it. And so we can talk, when we talk about usefulness, we can talk about the kind of citizen-centered effectiveness. So an effectiveness of the situation, but not seen by the point of view of the promoter, but seen by the point of view of the end user. So how much energy are you have to put to get some result? So there is an old notion of effectiveness that should be developed looking things by this point of view. And there is uh, how we can see all together meaning and sociability that is really the beginning of a new culture. The, I call it the emerging uh, hopefully sustainable qualities that are, in my view, the real signal of a new civilization that hopefully is emerging. 
through this social innovation. So to conclude, the uh, design issue here is a very huge, everything is designed, but the most specific design issue is about enabling and empowering that I like to give a slightly different meaning because enabling means to create an enabling system that permit to integrate the skill that is uh, lacking and the knowledge that is lacking that permit to integrate the physical resources because sometimes you have to do something physically so people have to be helped by this point of view and uh, to use the social network in which eventually people is already inside and so you can put all this together and to create what they call before the citizen-centered effectiveness. But there is also the empowering that means how what is done to not only to help you with what is missing but to increase what you have to increase your motivation and this is related to the visioning so people do it because at the end of the day even if they do a very little action they have a more general vision and triggering sometimes it's not only to politely say something about what is normally said a co-design story but it's also to make something happen to make some activism in some way they create the conversation and socialize this idea creating this conversation and this is about helping the emerging qualities and um, so this is the shortest way that I had to tell this last <laughs> <laughs> we will go into that later uh, first we ask
that's a really uh, important issue for me. Uh, because uh, a lot, uh, as you can see already on the, the slides before here, um, you know, social, the social activities, they are, they are very diverse, they are uh, in neighborhoods, um, uh, community gardens, and so on. Uh, we all have an, an idea about them, but at the same time we also know that uh, the, the social has been, uh, let's say, invaded and very, very deeply penetrated by, by technology. And now we come to a point where the technology and the, the network architectures are shaping the social. Uh, so, so we feel really that we are uh, somehow at the crossroads, uh, where where we still struggle because we can we can see both. We uh, also this morning uh, we had a we had a real struggle uh, to distinguish. You know, is this uh, technology driven or do we emphasize the the social and community uh, aspects? We can't distinguish them anymore. Uh, and that's not, uh, you know, because we are stupid or because we lost our way. No, I think that is precisely uh, the point where we are at, at, at the moment. And, and that's why people f uh, feel such an urgency uh, when, they t when they're talking about this, that um, uh, the decisions that we make at, at that crossroad uh, will really be, uh, will be inf important. In, 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 um, Without overemphasizing the role of technology, we we kind of all feel that you know if if the technology takes over, you know the technology really will define our social lives, and, and you all know uh, how, uh, how 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 this can happen. You know, on dating sites where where some company uh, decides for you after your profile who you're going to date. Now this, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's the most banal, let's say. Example of uh, of how the how, how technology shapes uh, the social, but uh, what I also find in a lot of the, the, the initiatives that we uh, you know that you see here and that we discuss here and that we want to um, um, uh, research and that we want to uh, promote uh, in this uh, in this research uh, that we um, are embarking upon together uh, is the, is really the the question of um, what is this uh, network effect? Um, um, and so now that a lot of people kind of have very, very basic networking skills, uh, it, it, is, it becomes quite important in what direction uh, the, these skills are going to be utilized. And what I see is uh, that in particular in, in business, but also in big data, in, in a lot of, kind of large-scale initiatives, we see a particular and very, very limited promotion of the so-called weak links. Uh, so what is networking? Yeah, uh, that is scaling up, that's what I call, you know, exploiting the weak links. Gather a lot of weak links and just see where you get, right? Uh, a, a lot of uh, kind of computers will, will help you do that because you can automate a lot of that uh, process. And so uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and all the dot-com companies, they all they were built on this logic, uh, further, further exploit those weak links, gather as much uh, you know, emails of you, and then, uh, you know, okay, and then they can import again 200, 300, 500 emails. And, you know, this is how these networks can grow very fast, very rapidly. Right? We are all, and, and that's quite surprising, on a global scale, we are now very, very familiar with the logic uh, of weak links. And so we know it precisely, uh, not, maybe not everybody is, is well, well aware how you can exploit them, you know, for your own benefit or for the benefit of your small group. Weak links? Weak links, oh, well, the weak links, is, the weak links is I am the friend of the friend of your friend, yeah? That's that's the weak links, and uh, and uh, if we if we add another network, your network will become uh, bigger, yeah. And so uh, uh, this is uh, kind of how uh, social networks uh, operate, uh, at, at least in the phase, in the initial phase of uh, of building. Of course, we know from the studies that people cannot deal with weak linking too well, uh, because after 500, you you've completely lost. Uh, the best, uh, the best number is around 150, and uh, in fact, you know, you will never really get uh, beyond those 10 or 20, you know, 
good friends that you have. This is all known and this has been researched time and again. Huh? But uh, in a business um, environment, yeah, uh, this, uh, this kind of expl exploitation of weak links also comes together, of course, very, very much in a kind of neoliberal environment where you, you, people have to uh, uh, promote themselves. So the, the weak links system is a very good system uh, in an unstable job market where you have to kind of, uh, you know, keep the ball rolling. And, um, and that's why I, I believe, and when I see those slides uh, here, uh, that, uh, in fact, the, the networks that we are interested in and that we want to promote are, of course, not based on, on those weak links. No, and quite the opposite. The, the networks that, uh, that we are talking about and the network effect that we are talking about are all about the creation and the maintenance of strong links. And it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, if, if, if an um, initiative, uh, you know, uh, or is only limited to, to 10 or 20 people, right? Uh, if the idea is good, yeah, maybe the idea can be replicated and then uh, repeated somewhere else, right? But what it is really about is the fostering uh, of, uh, of strong links. And uh, together with Ned Rossiter, for, for quite some, some years now, I've been developing, uh, further pushing the, let's say, the limits of the thinking about uh, what strong links could be, and, and what, what are strong links, and how can we foster strong links in a network society? Uh, and uh, we have called that uh, orgnets or org organized networks. And these organized networks, uh, the, the, there you can see that these two principles are coming together. There is openness, and the, the, the networks are open, and they, they foster the value of, of, of openness. However, they are also very, very much focused on collaboration and getting things done. And, and the emphasis is not necessarily, let's say, on the broadcasting uh, idea, on the idea that what you do is necessarily only there to be broadcasted to millions and millions of people through uh, the weak links uh, effect. And uh, as you can see in the slides here, yeah, yeah, I, I, I will come to and then, um, as you can see in, uh, in the, uh, the slides here, I think there is a strong emphasis on, on collaboration, getting things done, and on events, and real-time collaboration. I'm also very interested in the move within networks, the, sli the, the uh, slight move to real-time collaboration. Uh, because a lot of the, we know that a lot of the kind of frustrating effects from, from, from collaboration is often that it's not real time or not quite, or not as, the, as we really want it. And if we, if we have a very good feeling about getting things done, it's very often in a moment, let's say, what, of what I call time-based design. And so when, when it's really, really happening under a deadline, when you work together and, and get something done. And a lot of the, the kind of interesting uh, examples from our field are often, uh, you know, about that time restraint, where we use the time restraint to, to, uh, to make something uh, uh, together. And uh, think about book sprints, for instance, it's a famous example, hacker spaces, all the, all the um, you know, rapid prototyping stuff is always you know, about a, a kind of an artificial um, limit that uh, we put on our um, uh, activities. And um, uh, as Ross already mentioned here, I think that's, that's an important um, uh, aspect uh, if we want to talk about, um, you know, how to combine uh, the elements of vertical and horizontal um, uh, networking and collaboration, because in, uh, I, I believe that in, uh, in the explore, exploration over the next years, we will really uh, see that uh, the point where these uh, vertical and horizontal collaborations gather, that they are uh, the crucial uh, ones. Uh, so uh, the mere promotion only of decentralized networks is not going to do it for us. We have to uh, somehow uh, uh, bring it together. Okay. Um, we're, I think we are immediately in, already in a problematic situation. 
because um, you're saying that we should go for strong links and not for the weak links. Yeah. Um, would mean that the the type of events that you are showed us with thousands of people. I guess these people among themselves have weak links, but they have a massive yeah. impact. Okay. If you look at Avas Avas or I think I feel very uh, weak link to all these other I don't know millions of yeah. millions of people. But still, we sometimes can act together. We can have impact on, on the, 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 the Pipa, Sopa, Akta, all these kind of stuff. Well, the moment is you have to be uh, firm and together. So how do you see that? Is this, uh, do, do we need more colors than only weak and strong? Or how do we solve this problem? Maybe, you have... yeah, I mean, maybe as a short comment, like, I mean, as this case example that I showed, I mean, what, what was really crucial was, was that this whole culture was organized around groups, showing a certain specific group with a name. And that was really the key thing. It was not just like we are just individually participating in this massive thing, but you are a member of a group. And there's maybe 10, 20 people in the group. And if you do something you really good, then you are accepted to another group with, with more skilled people and so on. So, so I, I, I think sort of my example at least is, uh, I mean, at least I would feel that that's a great example of how is like weak as strong links go hand in hand. So um, this is also how how is being developed as, as groups with levels. So you, you, it's not just one big group of people trying to make code together. It, it's a very structured process. Yes. Where you have access to certain your code is being accepted or it's not being accepted. So there are a lot of models being used. And also and there's local Linux you know, user groups that you kind of you Often you are in past with your have some friends who are you know, working with this not like quite few people. I mean this is, I, I don't have statistics about Linux specifically, but I don't guess that, that people are just not like individual soldiers, they're about like, have those strong things. Yeah, so do you recognize? Yes, yes. I think that uh, probably everybody recognizes the different terms. But we have to manage the strong and the weak links. And uh, if I can make a small step backward, uh, I, I totally agree, except a certain rhetoric on technology. So in my view, there are some businesses that we don't like, but we have to take it different, what the business, some businesses interpretation, how to do, what to do with technology, because we cannot escape in some way from technology. So everything that, yes, because at the end of the day, we live in a social technical system. And uh, if we now make some comment about the technology that we have today, I have today say that my nice uh, group of people was based in any case on telephone, paper, automobile. They have technologies. So we can go back, 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 and we never find a, a day in which we were without technology because it's part of human being. So the issue is how we can manage the balancing between different rivalry, between the social and technological forces. But at the end of the day, if we use and I use social innovation, it's simply because for a long period it has been on the technological side of the social technical system. So I think that this uh, same to say, okay, let, let's talk about uh, the social side, but the both are social technical system. And what is the character of the new technologies? Somebody said, I like it, the expression technology is not good, not bad, and not neutral. So what does it mean? It creates a new platform in which different things can happen. And we are starting to understand what are the different things that can happen with the new platform, and it's exactly a different uh, one of the implication, a different relationship between the link, uh, the strong and the weak. And uh, to conclude, even if I come from who was trying to organize the strong links, I have to recognize that the weak links are very important not only because you can create being a group of people, but also at a small scale. Because the strong links tend to create the closer group. And the closer group could be politically very dangerous in this moment. So the closer group are the we against the others. So the nice thing of what is happening is that we can have groups, you call it organized network, I call collaborative organization, we probably have different terms, but the groups that have a, a density of links mm -hmm. and uh, afterward open 
uh, possibility with others. And to conclude, if you look really at the very uh, people relationship, there is also one good reason, because the deep, strong links are empathic. So you need to invest. So if we imagine a new society in which there is a much more collaboration, you cannot collaborate in an empathic way with everybody. You have to choose. You put your energy in the relationship with somebody, and you're very happy to collaborate with others in a very uh, programmatic way, in which you are not invest so much. In my view, this is the specificity of design, when we really enter how we manage these qualitative dimensions that could be what makes things successful or not. Are there any questions in the audience? Please let me know. Share it. Yes, please. Uh, a comment on, uh, on this issue of... Uh, you still who you are for the rest of the room. Oh, I'm Philippe Egrin. I'm I, 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 uh, one of the founders of an internet freedom organization. And I, I do also studies in the field of digital culture. What brings me to address this issue of uh, to, to bring some additional comments to this issue of, uh, of uh, strong DS uh, uh, of First of all, there is there is a dimension of who, who uh, decrees that there is a uh, uh, when uh, uh, there is no such thing as a naturality of a link. Uh, they are. They, you have. You have. Of course, you have connections between uh, between information. But uh, if you compare Facebook, even simply within social networks, if you compare Facebook and Twitter, you will, you will already for for both commercial organizations, you will see that there are uh, very different strategies about how the. The links are are recommended by these organizations. Second, in digital culture, uh, when you look at uh, uh, my my field is more literature. When you look in that, you will see that exactly like Ezio just said, you have small communities of very strongly connected uh, uh, people who basically uh, read. Uh, about everything uh, which is written by five people and maybe uh, once of a week uh, uh, look at what everything that has been written by 20 people. Yeah? And these, these communities, they are, uh, they are real laboratories of creativity. Uh, but they are completely unable to promote their the products of their creativity towards a wider audience. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, while uh, we, we key in, uh, communities perform much better, are uh, generally produce much less interesting uh, creativity, but are much better. So I think we cannot have uh, a, a pure judgment of value on strong DS weaking. The problem is how you you organize the, uh, 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 the interaction between the two. Thank you very much. There, uh, there's some other questions. I guess this, this is a, sorry, Peter Beck from NASA. Um, we're charity based in the UK focusing on innovation. I guess a question for Yuha, kind of coupled with Ezio's presentation. If participation and creation happens through understanding digital technologies, how, how do you make sure that people like me can understand what happens in that room you showed that picture of, of a thousand people on laptops. Because I, I don't get it, but I understand that it's probably the best way to kind of be able to participate and create in the future. How, how do you address that challenge around skills and capacity to, to engage with the digital bit of it? I, mean, I, I don't have a clear answer to, to that, but, but I mean, what, what I can say is, is that, I mean, for example, what has been now really powerful is this whole maker culture that, that has is, is really strong and, and at least based on my discussions with, with, with people who are more intensely involved, I mean it's really the fact that, that things are done physically, that you can actually show something 
physical to somebody who is new to the field and they can make the first physical thing themselves and that's really exciting and engaging and so on. So, so that, 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 that specific culture really benefits from, from having that tangible artifact to, to, to work with. And, and, and I know that many of these communities, I mean, I mean, let's say open source software, that's a great example of a community that wants to be open and, and often wants to engage other people, but, but um, it's not very successful. So I, mean, I, I, I guess there are certain areas. I mean, we are now, this event is, is one of them where actually uh, it's, um, you kind of need quite a lot of expertise and, 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 and sort of your own motivation in, to, get, to get involved. And, and this is sort of, I mean, I, I personally find this, this, this rule of one person that often if there is something that is of, of common interest, it's only like one percent of people who actually then really engage yeah. and so on. So, so kind of, I, I think in, in these most specialist communities, they kind of they are stuck there. That's <laughs> difficult to. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to... So a quick question for Gerd. Um, you mentioned that you know the
global struggle, you know, over these uh, technological uh, definitions of what what a network architecture is. Right? Uh, th this is an unresolved issue, and um, uh, that's why we we come together, and that's why there are so many conferences about this, and that's why we are all so passionate about it. Be simply because uh, this has uh, has not been uh, resolved, and there's uh, there's at least there's the hope, naive hope, I don't know, uh, that uh, you know there is still room for experimentation. This is very strange concept that we are all here together in this building, and we all are passionate about it. And at the same time, there's something that we are really afraid for. Yeah. And we don't really mention it, I think. I mean, it's sort of underneath our, our talks, but we, we do digital social innovation for something. I mean, it's not just because it's nice or strong or weak, it is some, we, there is something at stake. And I think this urgency is being yeah. felt by a lot, lot of people. But if you say that we don't even know what we're talking about, it's we really, uh, have to hurry up. <laughs> Please. Thank you for the intervention. I am Mike Pustet. Uh, no, I would like to uh, bring into the discussion about the strong and weak links, uh, all the analysis and the empirical work that has been done in terms of the distribution of the links inside of IPEP links in the web and also inside of the communities, online communities like Wikipedia or uh, collective processes like uh, the SOPA campaign or the 15 m mobilization in Spain. In all of these uh, examples, we find what is called uh, the power law, that is uh, only 1% of the, of the people contribute a lot, 9% contribute weekly, and 90% practically don't contribute. And this is very recurrent in online communities, even before the web. So, so, we, so it's not, somehow it's like, it's a recurrent element. This, we can put it in terms of, we prefer strong, we prefer weak. What we find is that actually it's very recurrent, it, it's very, and it's very ubiquitous too. And so what do we do with this? There has been a, a set of explanations about why this happened. It has, there have been like, the hypothesis of the uh, accumulative preferences. So the, the, this power law and the presence of weak link has to do and tend to appear in context of freedom of elections. So in, in context in which you can choose whatever you want, people tend to follow the previous person because they choose whatever they want, but they, they are affected by the preferences of the person who had chosen before. So someone who has previously had chosen something, I tend to uh, follow the same person that the other person. So if in Twitter someone follows someone, I, I'm going to do the same. So at the end, this end up uh, uh, reinforcing the power of. There is also the element of the, the low cost of uh, abundance. Well, in, in networks that there is very low cost of abundance, there is a tendency of a lot of, of accounts that are actually abundance. So they are not weak or they are not that they are uh, not participating, it's that they have abundance. So, and then there is the element of th that, that it's not that the strong links are more important, it's that both the strong and weak and non-participants are all of them very relevant for the process. The, the strong tend to generate the content. The weak map, the, the, like, create the, the hyperlinks with a much more broader network of, of knowledge and are super relevant, the weak links in certain parts. The non-participants are the audience. I mean, all of them are really, really relevant. So instead of focus of all, like strong or weak, let's think how do they ecologically reinforce each other and make possible all the process. And okay, and just want to say that instead of instead of thinking about problematizing the power law, it's about thinking because of its presence. It's about thinking the governance of the power law. So if we are going to assume that this is going to happen, what do we do with it? How do we govern it? Can you see each uh, uh, to round up and also to uh, respond to the questions? That's your can you start? Uh, to, uh, five minutes for this uh, panel. Uh, <laughs> you can read out for people, maybe. <laughs> no, as you know, these are really very complex issues, so you can go in so many directions. I try to figure out focus on the discussion. So uh, I, I I like it a lot what you said and I think that it's very important. It's a kind of a 
airplane view of what is happening. So I go back to my personal, uh, normal way of looking from inside, and uh, I think that uh, if we have to imagine the best of the world, uh, at least if I imagine, is that I can choose in my life. The real choice that I can do is where I want to put my empathic energy. So for instance, I like a lot to have a good relationship with my uh, people that are living near me in my home, and I will invest in that, and so I will have very strong links with them, and maybe I will be one of those that keep alive the community of the co collaborative housing, and I'm not interested in uh, transportation, and so I participate to a system for bicycling, uh, this, having sharing a bicycle, without uh, taking any real uh, commitment, if not uh, to do the minimum that has to be done. And uh, this possibility, in my view, this is really the possibility to offer to people the chance to choose what the profile or what you want to do. So we have not to think that everybody has to invest a lot because we cannot love everybody, so we have to choose. And so for me, the best would be if people could have the possibility to enter in different form of collaborative organizations in different way, having a different role, somebody sometimes simply making what has to be done but not to take in any other kind of initiative, sometimes being uh, of the core group that is really managing. I think that this is really a very important design side of the story. Yeah, the, the, the question today was, for this panel, was uh, what could be the impacts and what could be the potential of it. The, the question about what, what would be your, what would it be the best outcome? If you, it was 1994 that you showed us, and if you now uh, go 30 years further, what do you see then? What kind of impact has this movement then brought us? Uh, I mean, in in some way, uh, I mean, I, I I guess my my own feeling is, is that we are kind of entering the the sort of the era of, of global village in this. Marshall McLuhan kind of uh, way and, and global village in, in the sense that it's not like one happy big village but it's this sort of very messy chaotic village where, where people are, are sort of struggling to understand one another and, and somehow this is sort of somehow visible in all these like paradoxes like the Icelandic crowdsourced constitution was done mostly on Facebook and then at the same time we have all these other systems like email lists, we still have them and they are sort of, I think, very fantastic to, to sort of maintain these strong links. And here wrote, wrote this great book, My First Recession, it's a great book about email lists and that's still around there. So it's, a, it's in, in some way I, I feel that we are entering this sort of like very rich era of, 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 of information and communication and it, it comes with this this bag of, of a lot of uh, mess and complexity. So I mean that, that's kind of my feeling of the status quo but I have a lot of hope in terms of, of, of these emerging common platforms, paradigms and standards that, that there is also a chance to be actually, I mean due to the, the, the immense benefits that it would have like if it would be more if there would be more of us on in the same platforms and standards, then uh, it also could be that, that in 50 years' time we are living in this more harmonious <laughs> world where, where they, that, that we are using the same tools and standards and they are all open. So, I mean, I, I feel that this is also, I mean, some way I feel it's like this quirky moment. We, we are using the quirky keyboard, but the order of the keys is from the era when people had to write slow so that the machines wouldn't break, but we still use that. So I mean, I feel that we are in that, in that moment of where we could still, yeah, not go quite way, but, but find another way. Can we also end on a positive note? Uh, well, uh, yes. The positive note for me is, you know, that we have to design uh, the, uh, the network architectures that come after let's say, the deconstruction or the destruction of the cloud, the centralized systems, because the centralized systems, after WikiLeaks are anonymous and synonymous, uh, have come to an end. And, uh, you know, if you, especially if you hear what, what larger companies are, are saying, you know, they are determined to move out of the cloud. Uh, for a very simple 
uh, the, whole, the whole idea of, uh, of centralized uh, uh, information, uh, storage, uh, and networking has come to an end. And um, uh, so um, th that for us is a, is a, is a real challenge, for also for, for a, 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 um, a, an effort like, uh, like this research project, because uh, as you said, Kyle, we, we, we benefit you know, from campaigning. We benefit from a moment when, when, uh, when uh, an idea through strong links and through uh, a long phase of preparation comes to fruition and starts to grow. So we have uh, ambivalent feelings about, you know, should we give up uh, that, that great opportunity that we can suddenly, uh, like you said, with Abbas, where we can mobilize millions of people, you know, uh, what, uh, how, how, how are we gonna, how are we gonna uh, uh, deal with this? Uh, are we gonna preach some kind of offline romanticism? No, we're not. Are we supporting uh, local initiatives? Yes, but we also know that, as you say, but they, they are uh, part of a global uh, village, right? These small entities, they are part of a much larger um, ecology of, uh, of emerging ideas. And we're not so easily uh, going to give up uh, at that level. I think it's a nice challenge for the next panel. <laughs> <laughs>
ever had before in order to affect change in the world right into specific platforms, specific services which are targeted to achieve outcomes that people wouldn't have been able to achieve just a few years ago. So on the one hand, you know, digital social innovation is enabled by the internet, and Skype, and Basecamp, or other Facebook, or other platforms, but also that there are specific practices, specific organisations, and specific um, services which can achieve change and beneficial social impact. My, my session is, is really just designed to uh, give you a little bit of an insight into who are the organisations or the movements or certain services who are doing this type of activity. Really with a view to help inspire you and we hope at the end of this session you'll be interested in, and I'd just to inspire to find out a little bit more about the whole subject area. I'm going to try to finish today at 3.45 uh, so that there's, um, because there's another panel after this and I think people might want to come for a break and they might want to stretch their legs. Three hours of digital social innovation I think is uh, stretching. <laughs> so I'm going to try to finish at 3.45. Well, I've got a fantastic oh, panel right. actually. Uh, we've got Flo Berlinger, who's the co founder of Reshare. We've got Zoe Romano from Arduino. I'm going to come to them in a minute, but I just wanted to start by introducing, introducing you to Julian Tate from Future Everything, because I think with a, with a, um, with a cheeky uh, retort to the panellists, I want to kind of say, well, you guys might be the social innovators in the room, and we really want to find that out from you. And to that effect, today, uh, the, the project that we're launching encourages you to add your name or your organisation's name or your movement's name to a map of the ministry. So Julian, would you just like to, before we ask the panelists to speak, just like to speak about what we're, what we're doing today? Uh, right, so basically over the uh, past few months, uh, we have been developing a platform that will enable us to aggregate data. So it enables us to kind of map uh, this environment, so-called digital social innovation. And so, I'll just take you through some of the, the backgrounds to the project from our perspective, the technological background, and also, hopefully, if the internet's working, take you through the, the platform itself. Can you do that now? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm quite sure what's going on. Um, right, hi. Um, yes, as John said, I'm uh, Julian Tate from Future Everything. I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Kevin Smith, who is uh, who's part of the design team, and also uh, Bill Rock from an organisation called Slow, who uh, are specialists in, in linked data, linked open data. So the basic problem is how do you map uh, digital social innovation? How, how do you kind of uh, try to understand this landscape of, uh, of uh, social innovation that, that hasn't really been, been charted before? And when we initially came to the, pro the project, it was kind of what is out there, what can we already use? And actually, what we found is, although there's pockets of data, pockets of information, it's, it's, generally, quite, it's generally quite incoherent or it's locked up in, in databases that uh, have uneven taxonomies or, or, or are just locked away because they're, they're specific to particular projects. So, in a sense, it, it was kind of starting from a clean slate, really. So it was kind of, we know this, this People are working in collaborative uh, technologies. They're using digital technologies for social good. But but where are these people? Where how do how do you map these people? Where there's little or no data about this. So we were we understood our understanding was that by its very nature, um, this type of innovation is, is, is essentially collaborative. Um, this this was one of the kind of suppositions that we had is that. People share, it's about sharing, it's about using network technologies, it's about, it's about sharing knowledge and practice, and people enabling other people to carry on and, and do their work. And so how we thought we would be able to do this was, was basically using those collaborative networks that exist already in digital social innovation to, to kind of expose whatever um, Texture that was that, 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 that is basically supporting us. So the kind of data that we needed are 
are the actors who work within this space. So these are these are organisational actors. We're not necessarily dealing with individuals, but the organisations. And also, how do we how do we know that they exist? Well, we kind of know them through their activities that they, that they undertake, whether they be projects such as large EU projects or or the kind of support networks that they have. And also from these activities, there, 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 there is relationships that, that, are, uh, that are created from this. And so this, I think, would kind of um, paint the picture of this, what we perceive to be a, a very rich tapestry that's yet not revealed. So we kind of created this, because the data didn't exist or we, we couldn't really find it or get access to this, we kind of worked on, well, if we're working in, in a collaborative space, how do you... How do you create a platform that will enable this to come about? So it was the idea that we would create something that would crawl these relationships and crawl these networks in a kind of semi-automated kind of way. So it was designed to create a, a kind of rapid density um, that would enable a, a kind of a patterns to start emerging. So it was about, well, if I'm an organization and I'm, and I'm doing a project, then who am I doing this project with? Who, who are the relationships that I have that with? And then I refer those uh, those organisations to the platform, which then tries to expose further relationships. So, so it acts as a classic crawler in a sense. And through this, we kind of hope that it will reveal the people who are uh, who are doing the good work, the people who are the kind of or the organisations that, that are kind of. <coughs> super to an extent, organisations that do enable uh, disproportionately large amounts of other organisations, and also that the, this kind of end nodes, people, organisations that are dealing in a space where either their activity is just inward, or that they are, they are they're involved in activities that then, then is expressed to a, a, a community as yet unknown. But these, but these relationships have not yet been mapped, and this is the kind of potential that we hope that we'll or this is the, the, the landscape that we hope we'll be, be able to reveal. And also because essentially I think the organisations that are involved with this project are very firmly in the digital social innovation space. Future Everything um, has been around for 20 years, nearly 20 years now and it's worked on the kind of, in, within the space of open hardware, uh, participatory platforms and open data. And, we've, and we feel it's kind of, as, as organisations that exist within this space, I mean, this is the kind of feel that this is an appropriate way forward. So, I mean, what I'm just about to show you is the website, which is basically how a number of people will, will come, come across this platform. Although, because it's a, a, a generative platform, it works through associations and, and, and almost like friendship relationships, not many people will come to this, this platform through the website. They'll be invited by other people to come to the platform. And underpinning that is a, is a database that holds the, the relationship data, but also of a, a, a much more deeper uh, survey um, that basically will try and, 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 and quantify and qualify what digital social innovation is. And most importantly, there, there are linked data APIs where this data will be expressed in an open format. The, because you can't, we cannot claim to own or even visualize the community as well as people who are out there within the community. So, in a sense, it aggregates the data and then it expresses the data for people to use. And I say, this is open data. So, I will now try and demonstrate this. This is bound to not go right. Right, which I'm going to have to log in. So basically, when, when you... I mean, it doesn't look very populated because we've only just launched this now. But already there's this kind of dot starting to appear. And as you add your organisation, there will be, this will happen in real time. Okay. We'll perhaps not go through the logging process because that might take some time. So, so uh, this is my uh, email address for you all to see. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Don't email me with your complaint. Oh. Yes, do please tell me if I spoke to you. Julie, just to reiterate, this is an attempt to 
hear from people who perhaps we wouldn't really know about. So the benefit to being on the map is the idea that in fact you know, you're launching a network of people who are interested in supporting digital social innovation. Can you log in? I can't log in because I've got very good users for the past few This is uh, very, this is very good. Well, I'll tell you what, oh. we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 Sorry, I, I, we can't go through this whole kind of email, but I'll get the email notification. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I, can, I can show you that. But I can, I can show you, I had it all set up on me. There is a law of presentation. Oh, they, they, never, they never work. But, but as, as you already see, organisations organization, empty, enter their... Uh, enter their... Uh, Enter, enter themselves into the platform, and these these can be kind of um, their relationships within this platform can then be exposed. Say, if I go to Future Everything here, it's, uh, it takes a little time. Perhaps I should change the presence a little bit. So we <laughs> So what this will reveal in time. Is a uh, well then sh they will then show all the activities that the organisation is, is uh, involved with, and from that it will show you all the connections between those particular activities. So that's so that's uh, <coughs> that's our organisation. It uh, shows you uh, where it's located on in that, um, and then it shows you all the kind of, all the types of organisations that it's involved with, all the partner organisations that it's involved with. So already, with, in just a I'd say a matter of of uh, uh, say 10 hours, we're already starting to get a certain kind of network density, we're already starting to, to find where these relationships lie. And and it's the network density that I, that I think will, will start to provide uh, the, the data that will actually make further analysis um, obviously um, possible. And from that also, I mean, we're, this is still in a beta stage, but we will be also be providing certain types of visualizations as well. So, say if I click, if I click on, say, uh, digital social innovation, it will show you um, the geographical representation of all those organizations that are involved with that particular project. So, so it kind of shows you the geographic spread, and then you'll be able to link from, from different projects into different projects. So, in, in essence, it's kind of, it's designed to be quite quick. The, the, the actual data, the way you actually enter the, the uh, platform is very, very quick. It's just asking you to identify yourself. Are you who you are? And then encourages you to kind of start to give a little bit more information about yourself and thus spread your network. So that, in essence, is what it is. And I encourage everybody to, to take a look. And uh, through that, we should uh, be able to start creating some really good data. Thank you. Uh, Luis. I'll ask you to speak first. Who are the digital social innovators? Sure. Um, so I'll be very brief. I think this is a very good one. I really like how the, the relationships map to each other. Um, and so hopefully soon all of the digital social innovators will be on here. Uh, but for now, my name's Louise. I run something called the Social Innovation Exchange, uh, which is another job we term for six. Um, and SIX Network is a global network of individuals and organisations all over the world who are involved in every kind of social innovation, so specifically digital ones. Uh, but we know we have many digital social innovators in there. Uh, SIX is also responsible for, for running something called Social Innovation Europe, which was, the, which was I guess, a, a kind of earlier version of this with, a, again, a broader focus. But the Commission's first, um, the European Commission's first kind of nod um, to uh, trying to understand who was doing what and where they were doing it and what that looked like. I'll be very, very brief, uh, but on, on the answer to the question of who the digital social innovators are, I just thought I might share three examples that we're familiar with in the, in the SIX network who, who maybe you wouldn't have immediately thought of. These are not, um, these are not big campaigning organisations, not you know, platform, collaborative consumption platforms, but they're slightly different types of people. And I think they're interesting because if we're thinking about relationships, if we're thinking about networks, uh, which is more than a list, which means that 
people that we're thinking about have a relationship to each other, we want to understand the relationship we have, they have. I think it's important, or at least from the sixth perspective, what's important to look at is the qualities that these people have. And I think the one quality that all of these digital social innovators are starting to have, or the people that I see when, when we do our work around the globe, is that they have, um, they, they, the trust is really big for them. So there is a trust and a relationship in there, which enables them to go beyond the, the traditional ways of working. So the three organisations that I thought I might just mention are, are quite different, and trust is central to the way they work as networks, organisations using the internet, using the digital space, but who you couldn't do what they did without that, that element of trust and uh, So the first... Connectivity, kind of full traceability of all objects at one point becoming digitally enhanced. So we're not no longer talking about the internet, we're talking about an internet of things, which is not a very new notion from the 50s, cybernetics, Stefan Beer wrote brilliantly about it, the cyber sin, cyber stride uh, projects, um, ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing, ABS intelligence. It's all been around for about um, half a century, about 50, 60 years. But this new iteration that we see, especially of course with smartphones around and the amplification and the young, younger generation growing up in the browser, only 20 years old, so Mosaic still Christmas 1993. So what we're talking about is a space of 20 years in which we have this kind of web. Before that, we'd say the web was not the internet and it was much more so difficult for people to actually play around it. So this is what we're up against. And if you then look at blocks in the world, actually, block like China, with a um, uh, situation in which you know, the previous government, nine out of the 11 top politicians were engineers, which was, means that they already run, run the country like Google, which has about the same ratio of engineers, non-engineers, and there is a company like 90% engineers. Um, the state, which has which sort of um, not a big federal policy at the moment about it, although they have this uh, notion of cyber physical systems, which is running, which is sort of coming up, um, where cities are driving um, uh, adoption of, of, of new technologies, and of course the U.S. having this kind of more like this kind of yeah, let's try out things, and then here we are in Europe with our sort of risk assessments bordering on obsessive compulsive, um, and and our sort of notions of let's not try anything before we sort of try to find out with 1,700 stakeholders if there's somebody who can be hurt somehow, somewhere. Um, and with politicians who basically do not understand these shifts and are very worried and threatened by it, and by ministries and, and civil, civil servants who also feel very much threatened by the very notion that their expertise that they're having is no longer very much relevant to the situation at hand. Um, yeah, I would say that at, at this moment, the, the kind of the discourse that we have in Europe is very defensive. So it's, it's, it's very much on the, on the defense. It's very much on the well. Uh, there's very little enthusiasm actually if, you, if we talk about these these things. If you go to China, everybody's extremely happy with the smart cities and, and sort of well, let's let's do things. And also, of course, at, at the Silicon Valley, everybody's sort of starting up. And we weren't able to find even two million euros four years ago for Usman Hak's uh, patch bay. Just needed two million, and then we couldn't find it in Europe because venture capital saw no business case. Uh, and then, of course, he was bought by the Americans, calls them now excitedly. And this is sort of is the, the thing that I see happening, sort of basically all around. And it seems that we're not very, very happily dealing with change here in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe to pick up on Rob's point and, and take it a little further. Uh, last year we did a, a foresight, uh, our yearly foresight uh, exercise uh, that looked at the promises this year, it looked at the promises that digital technology had uh, offered to society and the economy. And uh, I'm not going to describe the whole thing, it's all accessible in English, it's you know, creative comments and so on. Uh, one of the things that struck us when we looked at the political discourse was the huge difference between uh, the way uh, Europeans, and especially the European Union, uh, framed 
the necessity or the interest of digital innovation in general and the US way. Uh, in Europe, it is here to solve the big, big, heavy problems that we have. So we have to talk about aging and climate change and etc. And, and of course, it, it's reasonable to do that. In the US, it's about crossing new frontiers and changing the world and, and bringing about a new Athens, and you might want to laugh about it, but there might be a reason why most uh, ground-changing innovations come from the US. And there might be a relationship between the way that they frame it, the naive way they frame it, and, and what comes about. Of course, there's a number of other things, like the amount of money, etc. But something is something exists around that. And, and it's related also to the way that digital uh, is changing innovation in general. Um, there's a sentence that I like very much from the Founders Fund. It says, uh, we wanted flying cars and we got 140 characters. Uh, and it's a very good illustration of the, ch the, the nature of a lot of innovations today which is you know, very agile, continuous, uh, ecosystemic, uh, multi-sided, and, and so you've got people who do a little a small thing that seems almost absurd, and then other people pick up on it and, and create value out of the value created on it, etc., etc. And this fits social innovation fairly well. Of course, I'm, I'm being a little fast about that, but it, it fits the way that social innovation tries to happen and, and builds upon uh, other people's work. The only thing is that our systems to fund innovation are absolutely unable to even see that. And would Twitter have received any money from European uh, innovation systems? Uh, would Wikipedia? Uh, would uh, Wikispeed that, that was presented uh, earlier on? Uh, of course not. There's no technology, there's no high tech in that. Uh, there's not a proven business model. Uh, there's no big players in it. Uh, so it wouldn't have worked. Uh, it, it would not have made sense. Uh, now, in the business area, you have other ways of getting financing. You may be able to convince other people because there's the old ROI issue. Uh, in social innovation, because we have accounting problems as well, you, you do not have that kind of re uh, uh, alternative resource. And this is one of the key challenges that we're facing here. So one way is to create alternative mechanisms, and this is being tried in many ways with alternative forms, etc., of accounting or of financing with crowdfunding, etc., etc. And this is a very good thing. It, it could be maybe supported even uh, by tax breaks and things like that. Uh, but then we have to work on how the uh, funding mechanisms for innovation work. Uh, and this is true for, for the whole of innovation. Again, for the moment, our innovation uh, funding mechanisms are unable to even see, understand, and recognize almost all the key innovations that will probably change our daily lives uh, tomorrow, uh, and mostly fun things that will probably not change much, uh, based on very reasonable assumptions that our uh, goals is to improve the existing health system, etc., etc. Um, it's also an inattention in technology. It's always been on the side of order and on the side of disorder. But our systems today in Europe are really, really unbalanced towards the side of order. I just want to say this one word, responsible innovation, right? Then, then yeah, we yeah. have a new sort of, yeah, I would no. say that sort of like Robert Manlin is also pushing that word in, in very sort of, uh, as the new sort of the word for the coming sort of 10 years. Well, this of course is, is like, so we're basically um, saying that Europe cannot be competitive and the, and the frameworks that are in place to fund innovation are actually wrong. No, okay. I'm, not, I'm just evoking no, that. But here, yes, <laughs> so some of you are going to do we're saying something similar anyway. So Philippe, what actually... Well, well actually, <laughs> I, I'm, I must say I'm a, uh, I'm a bit surprised because, you know, I spent seven years in the European Commission, but I, it's, it looks like you guys have spent much longer <laughs> and your, your way of thinking 
thinking is, is very much influenced, uh, for example, by, by taking uh, as, as granted a number of words, for example, competition in the first talk. Uh, and if you look in reality, my impression from my, my as, as much from my older civil servant experience and from my act activist uh, uh, experience of today is that actually what we have in Europe is and also to some degree in the US uh, is uh, an inability of policy to truly adapt to the digital revolution in particular to realize and, and consider as a fact of life the fact the, the degree of empowerment of individuals and small groups in uh, creating technology, uh, culture, and everything else. Uh, and uh, for that reason, coupled in Europe with an incredible domination of economicism, uh, uh, because social issues are, are analyzed with the angle of, you know, we need a flourishing economy and growth and uh, uh, in order to create employment and with that we capture money and with this money we will do social good tomorrow. Uh, and uh, in, uh, as a result, with the conjunction of both these uh, uh, factors mean that our present innovation policy uh, is actually very much supporting established players, in particular rent seekers. Uh, in particular, the rent seekers uh, based on property, uh, that is, for example, copyright stockholders, and the rent seekers based on control of existing infrastructures, for example, the telcos. And uh, it is completely unable for all the reasons that Daniel has explained to invest in uh, soci societal innovation. Uh, and so the real question is, you know, it, it has been like that for very long. Actually, I used to say, you know, the European Commission will never have financed the web in 1990. So it has been like that for 30, 40 years. Uh, and a growing number of people uh, start to, to ask themselves, you know, is it possible to reform policy? Uh, it's clearly very hard. And because it's very hard, I think uh, the people who, who want to create a better place for social innovation, for collaborative knowledge, for, for cult cultural, uh, a, a widespread cultural a contribution to culture, they really have to focus on a limited number of policy points. Uh, and I will back to that because this is a, uh, but clearly, uh, uh, what is happening today, for example, the real talk of the Lisbon strategy and the digital agenda is not competition, it's competitiveness. Nothing to do with competition means, you know, uh, uh, labor, cheap labor, we will buy cheap labor for production from emerging countries, and of course, they will stay stupid. Know, uh, uh, and they, they will never uh, they, will let us they, they will let us innovate and, and keep getting rents from our, our great innovations uh, but that's the real the, the real underlying talk from someone like John Mogg a Thatcherist who was a DG for internal market and, and it has spread even to the socialists um, I, I actually want to pick something up because if I take the scenario that, for instance, Rob was giving us, which means, okay, yes, it's true, there are powerful actors with social contracts that are broken and systems that are broken. But however, actually, the field we're describing here, now it's going to be disruptive and have a change. So wanting policies to change or not, this, it will have to change. And, and I think it would be interesting, and we discussed this, this like morning as well, what would be the reaction, actually, when disruption happens? 
And I mean here, I think disruption can be nice, like in the panel we described before, like, you know, more collaboration, great power of, you know, masses of people that work together, uh, there is no uh, enforcement on intellectual property rights, there's going to be uh, privacy and portability and citizens' rights, or disruption might be also the other way around, meaning more centralized power. Uh, and I think we are, we can see both scenarios happening at the same time, and it would be good to have one opinion from you on what are the possibilities there. And the second thing as well that I want you to answer is actually touching the point of funding. So I know it's not all about money, and it's certainly not about returns and investment, but I think the question of how do we fund this digital social innovation, and especially how we avoid, if for example we put public funding in infrastructure that serves the public good, how can we put in place self-governance framework and avoid centralized control in, for instance, a kind of NSA era where people don't trust those institutions anymore and don't even trust to put their data up on the internet if, it, I mean, if alternatives are not going to put in place? Well, I agree with Philippe on almost everything. <laughs> that, that, uh, but I will add a little bit of uh, a few things. I don't think everything is about money. That's, that's, that's the point. Because, uh, well, money was very important 20 years ago, but now anybody with a map with a PC can do almost many things. I mean, you do things in the cloud, you don't need this amount of money to buy good knows how many servers, because you have to serve good knows how many people and so on. That's over. That's many times over. So it's not only a question of money. And we have other, other things also on the table that, that probably we are not enabled, but also we have good news. It's also about creating markets or creating uh, places where attention can be can be can be there can be a kind of standard means conference grassroots uh, counters uh, that means in every adopter community that means people like that this type of culture it's about supporting entrepreneurs and supporting digital innovators organizing communities it's about all these kind of things and well, in, in, in America, I guess, things went a little bit better because you have this kind of foundations and, and, and uh, private foundations that can put money on, on many things that can support all these, all these things, and we don't have that in Europe. And uh, this space should have been covered by the Commission or by European funding, but of course, no chance. <laughs> that, that would have been quite, quite a, a joke to cover, to cover this space. So we don't have this space advice a little bit on COVID in, in the whole thing. But also we have other new actors. And if we talk about the future, I think we can have to talk about new actors. One actor are intermediate organizations, uh, organizations that organize communities like Open Knowledge uh, Foundation, or like the many others, that try to organize communities that try to do all this, all this work and, and provide governance and structure to these communities, create spaces for the diffusion of what this makes. And these are actors that are also abs completely absent in Paris. These are not seen by any of the of them. And are, in my opinion, are part of the future. Yeah, so I think, well, I think I am one of these actors. Right. So um, I think 15 years ago, coming across this ambient intelligence, Internet of Things, seeing it, it's very, very a worrying development, and there was people in the States setting up those spy chips, uh, Catherine Albrecht uh, seeing the same kind of, if we would have this kind of total connectivity with only like three big companies and four evil governments, well, that the matrix is there, it's still there, so it's uh, still possible. But um, then in 2004, we, we just saw the presentation of Zoe, we saw the, the Adrian Bowen and the Bricolabs and, and uh, the open, uh, the rep rep, um, that gave us, um, this first idea to talk about open hardware, that was the start of Bricolabs, which is still like 100, 150 some kind of people, sort of um, very sort of, yeah, chatty network is, is, is sort of, it's, it's, um, it's, it's more like a, a smell, somebody um, said, and I like that also, very difficult, difficult to get in surveys, but sort of like, an, it's an attitude of, of, of people. Now, to me personally, then, after written a text about it, very critical text, but keeping some openings, I was um, approached by Gerald Santucci, who was then head of the unit uh, RFID, um, to invite me for to moderate a panel on a Forum Europe Business Conference, which I thought was pretty 
uh, interesting. And after that, I set up the council because I realized we could we could have a kind of network, a more activist network, with pre-collapse, and then we could also build something which is now happening because we, I started in 2009. And if you Google now the Internet of Things, you find Council Fourth or something. And I've been giving input to people who thought that I was an official European Union unit. Uh, and of course, that, that, and then always net, net is playing. Sorry, it's just a URL. So what you say with the, the, so you don't need any money. We need a good URL. You need some organizational intelligence, and uh, you need a passion to to because you need to really really uh, think about something. You need really to want to want to put something out. What I wanted to put out was that what I found 15 years ago when I was in meeting rooms. It was like 300 engineers talking about ABT intelligence. There was no interaction design, there was no philosophers, no social sociologists, there was no no hackers, there was no um, no people, there was also no women. It was like 300 guys in the room, sort of organizing the next uh, level of what life was going to be. And um, I thought this is yeah, this is this is really this is strange, right? But again, I mean, if we're honest, uh, before that, this this strange thing called the browser and sort of this strange. Wedding of TCP/IP and this beautiful moment of Tim Berners-Lee open sourcing World Wide Web, which was a crazy moment to do, of course, at that moment in time. A few things like REST and APIs. Uh, we have a 20-year period, but we we are we are still sort of fighting against a situation where people had the, the ability to print books in, in, in 1451, <laughs> Gutenberg Bible, uh, and then we had the first public library in Holland in 1917. So we're up against power, who is able to stall distributing learning tools for over 450 years. Right? Public book lending in, in the UK is like 1918, which is the first moment where you can freely lend a book. Um, so if I ask in 1500, can I read a book? They burn me. Right? So it's, it's serious stuff. Um, so this, this, this strange situation that we have now is, of course, quite logical, because both of these governments, institutions, and, and, and all these people building their hierarchies, have been able to do this over the course of hundreds of years. They even built this strange notion of theory and practice, as if you have theory and practice. And we realize now in the network that there is not just no such thing as theory or practice. It's a, it's an, everything is an iteration and an ongoing uh, way of way of working. Um, so we, and I think the, the notion that the intelligence services like to use is super empowered individuals. Um, we, as a sort of a number of super empowered individuals, and there's a, a few of them here in the room, are unaccountable. Uh, we do not fit these kind of uh, formats nor procedures. So of course, these these kind of hierarchies that are used to dealing with with other hierarchies or with units that they sort of control find it very difficult to deal with that. And they should, because they probably they are they are they have a huge uh, legacy and overhead issues that we see now sort of basically in everything. So this internet this internet's already shown a huge amount of overhead and legacies of old systems, whether they're institutions or whether they're companies or governments. And this internet of things will will will, will show them even to this extent that they will have uh, this they will I don't think they'll be able to stand that transparency. So the question basically is, which is now happening, sort of um, how can we help these systems to survive? just like say 10 more years in a kind of way that, that we will help them to transform them into organized networks. Because we're not in trouble. Mm -hmm. I'm not in trouble so at all. So what's the answer to this easy question? You, you want to answer? No, no, I'll just talk about it. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, also Rob's okay. work, but yeah, Rob. Um, well, <laughs> okay. Uh, no, just uh, maybe again to, to pursue um, What's interesting is that uh, Rob's right, this is happening, uh, and that at the same time, we, have, we, we are witnessing with the Internet of Things the return of uh, ideas and visions that we thought were uh, gone forever. Uh, and I'm talking about my personal enemies, which are the smart, uh, whatever, uh, smart cities, uh, smart grades, etc., or the E-somethings. Um, and, and really, it's interesting because if you remember, uh, for those of you who can, uh, what computer uh, computer systems were equated to maybe 20, 25 years ago, they were big, silent, centralized uh, things. Uh, and then come the the uh, 
the microcomputer <coughs> come the internet and the world becomes noisier and messier than it's ever been. And that was not was what computers were supposed to do. Uh, actually, in French, we were so proud that we, trans that we had translated computer by ordinateur, which is things that put order or things in order. And, and this is a great lexical invention, but of course, so I, I'm trying to push this ordinateur, uh, but it doesn't work in English. Uh, so, uh, and then come the Internet of Things, and at last we can do a city and not have to think about those people who keep doing what we don't want to do, want them to do, or what did, not doing what we would like them to do. So, really automized cities that work on their own. Uh, and of course, a number of urban sociologists say, uh, well, you see, the reason why cities are so resilient is because it's never been like that. Uh, but we have the European Union and our own government who think that these are top priorities. These are our enemies, and they know they are the enemies of social innovation. This is actually the reason why they're doing that, because they want what has happened and what could happen to have been a short parenthesis in the history of innovation and, and of computing. So it, it is a struggle, uh, and I think it is happening now in an indirect way, but it is a struggle. Now, to come back to financing, uh, I agree that it, I, it's, it is a question of money. It is, not just, it is just not a question of the same kind of money and the same amount of money that, that what the big innovation projects need. Usually it's one, two, three zeros less that are needed. And actually it is the problem because asking for small amounts of money to public funding mechanisms is a nightmare. Uh, and of course you cannot do all the reporting and you cannot have plans for everything, etc. And so they tell, you want money but where's the control? What do I know? And, I, and my tendency is okay. If somebody takes your 2,000 euros and goes and drink them, uh, it's 2,000 euros that's gone down the drain. Uh, usually uh, what goes down the drain goes in millions, but you have the reports and the evaluations that go with them. So you're happy. And I, I've been seeing pro uh, projects that really work that way. Uh, they're geared, oriented towards the next evaluation, not towards the meaning that they're supposed to do. So, we could have mechanisms based on trust, based on the very small tickets, and, the, and maybe tickets that would grow when the result of the first 2,000 euros seems positive, then you go to 5,000 instead of... I know there are schools, for example, EPFL here in, in Switzerland has that for a number of innovative projects. So you start with very, very small tickets that just give you time to do whatever you want to do. And then you can do a little more. Or you were, talk, you were talking about one of your projects. What we need is to be able to hire somebody for, for a year. What is he going to do uh, about 55 different things? Uh, probably. Like everything. Uh, uh, well, I mean, that's what it would happen in my organization. So, and this does not work in our current systems. But this is what the kind of innovators that we're looking at uh, need. So, how do you build that? Uh, you need intermediary organizations that are capable of dealing with large amounts of money uh, on one side and small tickets on the other side, for example. You need peer-to-peer -peer trust things. You need reputation mechanisms, etc. This is probably possible, and I would tend to think that maybe one of the workshops that we should organize would be, okay, let us, not, let us fix the goal and say, and devise the mechanisms that make it possible. I think one day of creative thinking will bring about the mechanisms that make it possible. Just actually, a point on this, it's even worse because uh, if you go through this program, sometimes if you are a civil society organization, it's much harder to participate. You even get less money, like get less reimbursement if you are a big company. Actually, when we were participating to this CAPS, which is a program that the Commission just launched, which is collective awareness platform looking at grassroots groups, we actually pointed out to the Commission, look, we are actually bringing the new actors. They're all smaller groups, maybe like two people working together, or they're civil society organizations, and they cannot get 
75% funding back, so they can only get 50% because all you know you need to prove to be either a company or a a public entity in order to be more reimbursed. And I was saying this is actually a bit strange. So I think yeah, a lot of brainstorming needs to happen there from big concrete solutions. Yeah. I seem very proud of public research framework. In, like in general, I think really Europe is the only place where we still have public research frameworks in place. Well, I I would like to put on the table uh, two other reasons for which uh, money still matters uh, that that actually lie for uh, a little bit beyond uh, the question of how do we get our stuff financed. I mean, because we are in a workshop uh, on digital social innovation, and if I look at what is my my uh, domains of activity, uh, peer peer to peer commons based production, uh, digital culture, uh, and, and collaborative platforms. Uh, basically, okay, this is this is not too bad at the level of sustainability if you take in account participatory financing. In Zoe's talk, uh, you could see that uh, there were quite a few projects. Uh, and of course, this is because when you say the word Arduino, uh, there is some magic that operates. But uh, uh, this is growing today, this, this process. So what are the two other domains where we need uh, uh, money and we need public policy to organize the availability of this money? One is the widespread ability to contribute. Because look at us in this room. You know, of course there are more women than usually in a technology related conference. And that's enthusiasming, though it's still not parity. But we are all white, highly educated. Uh, uh, we are uh, probably, uh, we are absolutely not representative of what the global citizens of Europe or elsewhere are able to contribute to the domains that I have given. And what is missing for them to contribute uh, is mostly time. But we live in societies where time is money. But even smaller bits of money than the, the money we have just mentioned. So there is one first angle of policy is we must have policies that support the ability of free time and if we, not just policies but also individual action to make it possible uh, and, uh, and we must have financing schemes that go together with it, whether it's uh, uh, fiscal policy for fi uh, participatory financing uh, 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 other resource policy mechanisms, whether they go towards basic income schemes or they go towards uh, what I recommend, which is more specialized resource pooling in domains or stuff like that. And so that's one key question because we are not, it's not, if you take a humanistic perspective, it's not just about uh, being happy because things happen that are great, it's about, it's about it may, uh, being a, a, a source of, of uh, uh, capability building and fulfillment for everybody uh, and uh, or more people said to be uh, uh, cautious. And the second domain is, as Gert uh, Loving said to Tala uh, 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 in the first discussion, we are in a situation where we will have to rebuild the network, the universal, uh, open, trustable network from the ground up. Uh, and uh, uh, after the collusion of the invocation of security, of cyber security, and uh, the desire of, of the uh, large companies to abide uh, to security driven uh, orders because they know it brings also more power for them. Uh, we need to bring, to build new infrastructure, truly decentralized, uh, uh, truly point to point, and this is, uh, building new infrastructure is costly. 
it's much less costly than when the internet was was designed in the seventies, but it is costly. And uh, and so, in my opinion, if we can get a little bit of these two things, uh, 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 it's for public policy to support uh, the, the rebuilding of a trustable internet is not entirely impossible because. You know, they have also infuriated diplomats uh, about <laughs> being spied upon. They all uh, they they are they are also afraid of being personally spied upon. I mean, you can you can play on some stuff, and I hope we will be able to get some money from there because it will be. If you look, for example, uh, at the efforts we have bootstrapped with my friend Evan Moglen for the Freedom Box uh, uh, and the, de the very slow development of the Freedom Box Foundation uh, and the even slower development of uh, software that can uh, really run on this type of very small form factor mechanism uh, devices, we can see that you know we are not moving fast enough in these domains. And, uh, and so I hope we, we do better in the coming years. Um, thank you. I think it's actually clear that when we open up um, a political debate or a policy debate in this area, we're just talking about infrastructure that touch upon really key issues such as identity, such as citizenship, such as trust, such as really kind of fundamental things that actually glue people together, build a society. <laughs> and a social contract. So it's actually a big ambition to think about policy in this new um, connected era. I want to open up to the public because I think we have um, 10 minutes for discussion and I think I already have a question here and then another question there. And yeah. Well, since we're addressing the whole issue of um, funding also for uh, and, and to find a position within the policy framework for this mm -hmm. type of uh, activities, I'm afraid we also have to uh, rethink the whole terminology around macroeconomics because there's almost no way that we can prove the type of growth that they want to see. So, so the whole definition of economic growth is is outdated and there are no new models. There are no new algorithms. So all the systems that are are, 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 are looking into like business investment and what comes out of it they are not ready for the type of stuff that we're doing. So I think we all have to move now to economics and to sort of take it in our hands and redefine growth and redefine the economy. Yeah. That's also, I think, in, in the project description, it says social economic growth, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? Which I thought was very, very clever from, from the first point of view, because it's already sort of creeping in this kind of, this kind of nuance, and that's indeed uh, very important. Now, sort of, so I've been in this more like this uh, smart city feel than these sort of uh, you know things types, and I think what the commission is getting is, is gearing up. I mean, um, it's no longer possible sort of not to, to do something and not to build on other things. There are so many dinosaurs and legacy projects out there that so so much good software repositories repository that nobody knows about, and so sort of finally they're sort of going to um, uh, to, to these in a new project. I'm also involved in a new project called Sociotal. I'm going to be the community manager for Smart Santander, trying to get new user communities to really work with the, the large sensor grid that's out there with new business models and new services. And that's, that's sort of the plan. Um, and they're really, the, the, the metrics that we get is really is pretty tough. Uh, we, we need to get such a certain amount of people on it, and it has to work. And, sort of, and this is going to, 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 to get better, I guess. Also, if I may say, uh, because um, we Again, sort of, we're not in trouble. Sort of, the people starting up on open, cheap open hardware, cheap open software, data analytics, that's nothing. Data storage, that's nothing, right? Sort of, like, it's, it's springing up all across. Uh, the, the, even the, the economists had to come out with the economy of sharing. People are buying less cars, the kids are buying less cars, sharing cars, sharing tools, sort of. It's all there, it's happening. It's just, it's party. It's sort of, everything is going well. There's nothing really troubling in front of us, and this is going great. So. What's actually in trouble is these policy makers themselves, is, the, is, is these big houses themselves. Um, two or three day, days ago, I was in a, in a things sort of meet up with, uh, actually in Holland, with Sintens, uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs in Holland, doing great things. And we were at Siemens, and it was like, 
where were they? Of course, well, they were built in the 70s, so they, they were right next to a ministry. Why would you, we, do you want to be in the right next to a ministry? Well, everybody goes out for lunch and you can do all these things. It was a huge, huge building. And we were thinking at the same time, look at all the overhead these big people have to pay now, right? So all these big companies, these 300,000, 400,000 companies, are, are, are shifting dr dramatically at the moment that we speak. Cisco is selling its hardware, going into output-based business models and realizing that once we are in this kind of Internet of Things environment with full traceability, there will be whole new notions of currency and there will be whole new notions of with full traceability is no money for insurance because you know where everything is. It's a huge ontological shift that is happening. It's not a small thing. So it's actually not, again, not us who is in trouble. It's, it's, so we have to be very sort of careful sort of in trying to find a balance between what our work now is going to be. So our work partly can be energy directed to helping other people to understand what's going on. But should we devote all our energy or half our energy to, to try to explain to old actors that are dying what is going on? Should we not invest that energy a bit more better in our own forms of quality, our own ways of working? I suggest we do the second. So find a balance, because oh, I really believe we, there's a big need still for these policies. We are learning, learning a lot in these projects. I'm learning a lot from the expert groups. I'm learning a lot from European Commission ways of working. I'm learning a lot from bureaucracy. It's extremely important, because again, the, the sort of the... Yes, it's, I mean, it's, 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 up, it's, um, yeah. it's public money after all, it's exactly. business, business, business money and should sure. be well invested and well spent, I guess. Um, that's a, yeah, I want to make a short note on the last sentence that you said and summarize a part of the discussion about the fact that at the end of the day we are rediscussing how a new social fabric has to be built. And I want to put this issue. In this discussion there is something similar to what is the European way of doing that. And uh, the, the, the idea came in my mind when uh, Daniel was saying uh, if we had uh, this uh, idea, you must be very naive to help. And uh, I think that probably we are not in general so naive. This is good or bad. In my view, there is something that is also good, even if it is also bad. And I think that even if we are talking about something that is disruptive, my idea of what happened after the disruption is that you build with the material that you have. So if we are here in Europe, we will rebuild a new cathedral with some material that we already have. And the material that we have already have is the European countries. So the European culture is blending in some way. It could also face complexity in a different way that is going to be by the Chinese or by the American. And this is good not only because I'm European, but also because in some way one of the issues about sustainable culture or the culture sustainability is to maintain the variety. So it will be really a very uh, negative effect if uh, all this uh, repository of culture that we have in Europe you know, disappear because we have to be more than a little bit as well. So I think that this could be really an interesting topic and in some way uh, to discuss about uh, the new thing that we are discussing in a more technical way is linked to the idea of Europe. And we have something uh, okay, in my mind when we were talking very interesting about the mess test that is totally different from the European Turkey and yet. But the uh, person has, uh, again, to talk about French, Edgar uh, Morin, he was talking, he is talking about uh, an idea of Europe that accept, accept complexity and messiness in a kind of frame, framework of the ecosystems. Yeah. I mean, I also just to add here, because we've been mentioning smart cities and so on, I really trust that what you just said is the key also to approach this kind of question of what do we do with cities. Because actually the smart city, it is an empty box. They're not inhabited, so they won't take off in the way they've been conceived. So the only, the only way that we have to actually get cities to, to, to leave, it's starting from this 
cultural messiness, this, this unfinished design, and this actually unexpectedness of cities and their inhabitants. And that people will build the systems that they think they are more appropriate. It's going to be a mix of messiness, and, and you're, but you're, you are going to lose your washing machine. I mean, that will be our beautiful six, and we will run it when the grid runs it. It's also, it's just a very small moment in time that these things will sort of like personal. So we cannot go back to the romantic notions of, of messiness, really. That, that is really unhelpful. Um, we must find new, as, like Malay says, we need a new discourse. And this discourse needs to be sort of redefining what growth is, but it also needs, needs to redefine what life is in, in, in these circumstances, because we will have a huge amount of technological complexity and a huge amount of connectivity in, in, our, in our streets. If you, if you do not want, are willing to accept this, you, you will be in, in, in you, you will just not be able to function. So we, this must be in the equation. There are questions coming from any of well, I don't know if it's so much of a question, but I, sorry, Peter Beck from Minster. I guess one of the things I find interesting about, we talk a lot about kind of systems and big things, but it, to me a lot of this is not about, it's not about money, it's more about, I can store all my personal health data and generate huge amounts of value around my personal health care, my, my training sessions. My grandma can go out to Tyson and connect with other old, old people and support each other. But it happens in kind of separate silo to what happens when you go to the doctor, when you go to the nurse, when you talk to the soft care provider. And there seems to be, and this is the case not just with digital innovations, it's the case with most new innovations that kind of generate social value is they, 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 op, they operate in kind of a, in a separate silo to the rest of kind of how we think about delivering public service or service that have a social impact. So I think sometimes it's, it's, it's dangerous to go into like a, there's a separate stream where we can support this. It's more thinking about all of those great, these great stories we've heard of for the last three, three hours. They help achieve what, if you go to a public commissioner in the city, he will say, on my to-do list of stuff I need to achieve. These are the things, but they think within old services and old ways of kind of generating those services. And I mean, just as much about kind of changing a culture and a mindset within organisations, how they think about who can provide what kind of service in the year, what time. Yes, it's, it's a, yeah, I totally agree. So half the things that we're doing in terms of like um, consultancy-wise, Internet of Things project, half of it is technological, half of it is plain old change, uh, change management, and and that's. Uh, that's sort of this 50 percent change management is the key basically because we're talking about organizations that are in silos that need to start to start sort of linking data and making it interoperable and this is not one of their sort of their forties no. I think um, before I'm oh, sorry go ahead. I would like a, a small comment I agree with you in many of these uh, these trends from Europe and we have been talking about that the problem as it's said in Europe is that, that the only thing that we can do is to change the world and we don't know how to do it. And that's, I mean, we have a lot, of, we have the European Commission, we have a lot of, very, all these states, but it's the European Commission, this in, in the states, it's difficult to have, you don't have this very effect, make networks, it's, it's really difficult to put any such programs, you cannot do things like this. It's a very different world. But at the same time, it's a very centralized organization, and we don't have the exit ways that we have in our countries. We don't have the capital, we don't have foundations, we don't So things have to come from these mechanisms that now with the crisis on the periphery and periphery countries is becoming like the only one where to get money or where to get projects and so on. So the only way is to change the world. But nobody knows to do it. I know, I know. How, how to do it? I, uh, I, I would challenge that. I would challenge that. that because, I'm sorry. There are so many good projects that would be shown here. Jacques Arloum project, uh, why can't you just, uh, I mean, it really change the way that you fund projects. Why can't you fund thousands of people to have their own Jacques Arlooms all over Europe? <laughs> Restart a textile industry rather than buy Chinese stuff. You know, I mean, there are simple solutions to uh, transforming the economy. Yeah, no, that we're showing. Yeah, no, no, we, we agree with the mechanism. I mean, uh, we set some mechanisms. We will agree very easily. In fact, we will agree with many mechanisms that will work well. The problem is uh, how you change the organizations that find this mechanism. I mean, the commission. How you change that?
course, we're going towards the end of the panel. I just wanted, because we had a, this conversation before, and you said, I think, uh, Philippe, you said something about, I think we shouldn't just talk about regulatory or commercial right. framework, we should talk about systems of sustainability. I mean, I think this is coming back all the time, and I think, actually, uh, what I heard before is a new way also of thinking about how things might work in a sustainable way, where maybe we have less washing machine also because probably we are not going to need all these washing machines, you know, or, or, or machines to operate in this way. So I think I would like you to close maybe with a sentence on this and maybe also a sentence on how do we empower things to, to change because we've been saying a lot of times that we actually need things to change and I think we are in a position of making some effort there. So I would like you to maybe just give a conclusion um, sentence on this. Well, since I raised the big sustainability issues, uh, uh, apart also from the very important comment from Marlen, uh, I, I, I'd like to say that we have to be careful because the sustainability problem are not just about uh, uh, sustainability of financing or even about sustainability of economies. We, we are going to face uh, uh, sustainability challenges that are internal to uh, the commons based peer production. For example, if you take the field of digital culture, uh, we, have, we have grown in, in a world with a representation of what is an audience for a work or for an author or for a creative or for a tool. Is, uh, uh, is absolutely not sustainable to keep that type of numbers in a world where there are 10 times more contributors. And, 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 and so it's not even a question of which power law is at work or whatever. It's simply a question that the balance between contributors and consumers that was established during the industrial era is no there to go, and and when it goes, it means that you know you uh, and we, we are already there. It's just we think it's it's just some harm that has been done to us. You know, if I, if my poetry blog has only twenty readers per poem, it's 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 not because people steal my poems. It's just because this is the number of people that are there to to be interested in them. Uh, and but I never, and so that is going to be a, a big challenge because it is a challenge within ourselves. It's not a challenge uh, that we have, and the same goes for for uh, uh, production uh, and and uh, degrowth. Or you know, we are we are turning around uh, uh, by saying you know new type of growth or whatever. But degrowth is there. It's going. It's going to be there by people going away from fake meat, and it's it's the more they are smart, the more they will do it. And we we are delaying having the policies and and uh, and the and advertising are delaying it, but it's not going to 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 last for long. And the last thing is answering your question: How do we uh, enable change? And that, to that, there's only one answer, is by making it fun. <laughs> yeah, fun, fun is really cool. Uh, and, uh, and actually, what we need is, um, of course, we need to think long term and, and, and to, need to think about how, how we need to change the global model and the way that we, we count for things and, and the European path towards a new development model. And, and, and of course, it, we have to do things before it happens. And actually, we have to do things because otherwise it will not happen. Uh, so we have to, to have both uh, the discourse and the big story and to try and write it uh, in, in pleasant and fun ways as well. And then we have to be able to do things. And, and one of the things that I'm thinking is that uh, we can we just, we don't need as much effort and help because a lot of things are happening. A lot of people are doing things. Uh, 
And, and so maybe one of the ways that I was suggesting at some point to the French system was to say, okay, do whatever you like with 95 or, or even 98% of the money that you, you invest. Just trust social and on-the-ground innovators with the rest, with the 2%, uh, and, and see what happens. And this is probably going to be enough. So again, and this is feasible. Uh, we can describe the ways in which this could happen. Uh, and, and if we did that, then we would start a movement where institutions would start understanding what happens on the ground. And this is the key issue. Well, um, I, I don't think you would also with, with the fact that the, the contract really has ended now. I mean, we really have it. It's, it's been enough. And um, uh, I'm sort of I'm very sort of happy that some I brought a scenario ten years ago uh, about some kind of total breakdown and it's now published on the Futurum side. It's now an official future for Europe. So it's called the bad war coming or a bad war rising. And um, uh, yeah, it's basically the fact that uh, you, you you cannot create a situation in which you disambiguate. Um, uh, borders and and and, net, and sort of privatize all the, the all the uh, the things that people have and still ask them to pay 50 percent of their money in taxes. So uh, this will no longer uh, sort of go. People will stop paying taxes. All the jails are full. So it's also there's no more stick. The emperor's clothes will show pretty soon because all the taxes that you pay on a national level do not come back to you on a local level. There are some some really European hole and 80 percent of all the law of the country comes out of Brussels anyway as well. So this was feasible as a kind of way of working in the old man in the 50s thinking this up without, of course, seeing or even could, could imagining that civilians and, and individuals could become systemic forces. Of course, it could not proceed the browser coming up in 1993. So now we're in a situation where there's a growing number of people, citizens and users, who can organize themselves much better as well. Before that, in the 1800s, you could only go and protest and get beaten on your head by the police. Now I stay at home, organize my own energy through my own energy supplies, uh, fetch pay sort of style, and uh, there's nothing else of need from anybody anymore. So 60% of the, all the building in the US at the moment is gated communities, the same amount of uh, percentage going on in China. The world will more look like Brazil, and so, sort of Sao Paulo will be the model, and in Europe there will be as well. All the money moving away from the middle will not return. Nobody will invest any more in the sewage systems in Spain, they'll, they're, they're investing in smart cities. The smart city is the business model for the Internet of Things. So that's what we are facing. Europe will be 200, 300 smart cities, Mad Max in between. So let's start fab living our technicals or getting really, really rich and buy a place in the, in the, in the smart city. There is a way out, and I really believe that, <laughs> I really believe that this, the business, this way no, is out. Please. Okay. No. And this, this, this way out is something that we can uh, sort of uh, uh, manage, but the urgency, I would say, is there. It is it's a very real scenario. Well, my message is very simple. I think we all agree that innovation has to change from large companies to small innovators and so on. That doesn't happen in many, in every field. We were joking before that probably in nuclear weapons that doesn't happen, but then we thought that maybe, well, okay, that. It's a good example of distribute nuclear weapons. <laughs> so maybe it's happening in more fields than we think. But if this has happened, innovation policy has to change too. We cannot continue supporting the old. We have to support the new. We have to support the future. So it's as simple as that. Let's go and support the future. Okay, so I thank you everyone here. I thank the panel very much. Thank you for having us. Social EU, so we'd love to hear from you. Please, like, try to register on the website and be part of the conversation. Thank you.